Hey, James, good to see you again, buddy. How are you? Hey, doing well. Thanks for thinking of me. Of course. No, it's a thrill. I've been looking forward to the chat, uh, getting it inserted into just this really interesting kind of conversation that a lot of us are having now around the future state of audience building and kind of where that's going to go with so much new technology, so many new kind of engagement methods out there. Certainly here at SPI, we're talking a ton about community and, and kind of what community memberships are doing. Mm. But for you, with so much success, and I think so many people know you, of course, and rightfully so because of your mega success with Atomic Habits. Uh, but really, like, uh, as I've known you over the years and, and kind of studied this, like it's audience building first that kind of got you into that position, or at least was really helpful, you know, in this like mega launch, you know, that you had. So for folks that maybe don't know you first as at least I deem to be like a master audience builder, what's what's the story been up until now around even potentially when we first met in the past of uh, Panda years to like now, what have you learned along the way during that journey? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of ways to win. So, you know, that's the first thing, like you don't have to do it the way that I did it. Uh, but you're right, I do kind of think about it audience first, and then, uh, you know, products and things come later. There are many other people who've done it the reverse way where they start with a product, and then they use the launch of that to sort of build their audience. Um, so, uh, you know, I think you have to decide like what makes the most sense for your style and your business. In my case, um, you know, I was just doing a couple of things to like get by and pay the bills early on. So, you know, I was doing like freelance gigs and making like websites and doing some web design stuff, which is like a real generous term because I'm not a web designer, but you know, <laughs> I knew enough to build a you know site for an insurance agent who didn't knew even less than I did. Um, but uh, anyway, so I, I had a couple of those gigs throughout the first couple of years, uh, freelance things and, you know, stuff that was like helping me pay the bills. And then while I was doing that, um, I started a couple of different websites. You mentioned like Passive Panda and a couple other things that did fine, but never really took off. Um, but it was the way I spent the first 18 months or two years. And it allowed me to learn what a website was and how to start an email list and, you know, just like all the stuff that you don't know that are kind of one-time costs when you're getting started. And then about two years in, 18 months to two years in, I realized like, oh, what I really want to write about is habits and behavior change and improvement and performance and all the stuff that I've read about now. Um, and so November 12th, 2012 was the first article that I put up on jamesclear.com. And I decided that I was going to write a new article every Monday and Thursday. Um, I didn't have any like big, deep reason. There were, you know, some other people like Chris Gilbo was writing twice a week and there were a couple other people doing it as well. It just felt like a pace that I could actually stick to. And so I did that for the first three years and, you know, wrote a couple hundred articles and focused on growing the audience and so on. And uh, that writing habit of writing two articles a week for the first three years, that was really the thing that launched my career. Um, and so that consistent writing schedule in combination with a good topic, um, you know, it was a topic I was interested in and habits and behavior change and performance and improvement are topics. A lot of other people are interested in too. So I was fascinated with it. I was writing about it consistently and the audience wanted to hear more about it. And, you know, it took me two years or so to find that thing. Uh, but once I found it, I just kept hammering away on it. And after doing that for three years, the audience had grown based on the strength of the email list. I was able to get a book deal, which eventually became Atomic Habits, although I didn't know that at the time. Um, wrote the book for the next three or four years, and then that launched in 2018 uh, and kind of brings us so, to sort of the present state of things. And to, to potentially help give better definition even to the present state um, around how large and engaged that audience is and the success of the book. Um, are you comfortable sharing some numbers? Uh, uh, I've sure. known, yeah, I, I certainly haven't kept track probably all that well, uh, at least even this year with how you know large it's gotten. Yeah, um, the book has been out. It'll be out almost, it's almost been three years. Uh, and Atomic Habits has sold about 6 million copies worldwide. Um, the audience, the email list is about 1.3 million people now. Um, I think we'll probably hit 1.5 by year end. Um, we're adding about 500,000 people a year or so right now. Um, of course, you know, it, uh, depends on, you know, there's always like people churning out and stuff too. So, you know, net growth may look a little bit different, but, um, but it's still growing quite quickly. Um, social media was not a big focus for me early on. Uh, I really resisted it for a long time and just focused on email list growth and writing. And I think that general strategy of focusing on one platform, I don't think it has to be email, although I, I still think it's the best and it was the best for me. 
Um, but I think the idea of focusing on one platform and crushing it there and then using your success as like the tip of the spear to have an entry point to other platforms, I think that general strategy is pretty good. Um, it's hard to be good on a lot of platforms at once and spread your attention, you know, too thin early on. But uh, anyway, so email list is over a million people. And then um, when the book came out, I think I had about 18,000 followers on Instagram. So it was fairly small, but that's over 500,000 now. Twitter's over 500,000. Um, so that's grown a lot more in the last like two or three years as we've kind of focused on that um, uh, since the book has launched. I'm curious if you even have stronger opinions these days thinking about early stage creators trying to get up and running and heading into 2022 you know, in a universe now where attention span seems more, more fractured than ever, there's more channels and platforms than ever, TikTok, et cetera, especially in the social space. Do you think that's, that's even more important these days to really just start with one channel and, and try to crush it there before trying to layer on uh, too many others? Yeah, um, you definitely need some, uh, some amount of focus, you know, like the more you divide your attention, it's just hard to excel and stand out. Um, you know, the reality is the web is kind of platform centric right now. Like you have a lot of people who are Instagram and TikTok people, but they don't really use Twitter or podcasts. And then you've got other people who like are all about YouTube and they don't really pay attention to the other stuff. And some people who are all in on podcasts and Twitter. And so it's, you've got different readers or different, um, you know, audience members in different spaces. And all of those platforms are, you know, they're all still relatively young. It's still a fairly new phenomenon, but they're much more mature than they were in the early years. And to stand out there, you got to be a really, you know, talented creator on any of these platforms. If you want to stand out on Instagram, you need to be in the top 1% of Instagrammers. If you want to stand out on YouTube, you need to be in the top 1% of YouTubers. So um, it's just hard to compete with other smart people if you're trying to do like five things well, and they're doing one thing really, really well. So I do think you need some amount of focus. There's, uh, there is a way to sort of utilize the benefits of a platform that's like well fit for whatever your particular um, uh, business is, and then also combine that with email. So like, one of my friends, she runs a hand lettering studio and all of her work is, you know, very visual and designs and prints and so on. And so Instagram is an obvious fit for her business and she's able to post everything there and share her latest creations and then also drive people back to the website and email list. And so she can kind of do both because it works really well for that business. Um, and she's not really like wasting time and effort. She already created the print for the business. So might as well take 20 seconds and post it on Instagram. Um, in my case, I think Twitter is the kind of obvious connection point. You know, it's text-based all the writing and articles and email and book chapters I'm writing have text. So might as well pull a couple sentences from there and post it on Twitter um, if it doesn't take that long. So I think there are ways to, if, if it's aligned well with the medium that fits for your business, there's ways to use one or two platforms strategically without it taking too much effort. But I don't think it makes sense to try to like be big on, you know, five different social media platforms or even three, uh, especially early on. Yeah, you, you've always emphasize, and I've always appreciated, yeah, writing as your medium. Uh, I believe you're working on a podcast, but you don't have like an audio component yet, uh, I guess, separate from the, the audio version of the book. Yeah, really um, just the audio book's the only thing we've done like right. that. Uh, unless I've missed it, uh, I don't think you have a YouTube channel or do all that much on video outside of, you know, virtual summits and stuff like this. But um, yeah, I, I wonder how much that was in intentional on your part, certainly along your journey at different inflection points where, like say with your newsletter, continued to, to grow and boom and probably went through again some inflection points. Uh, somewhere along the way, you really condensed down into this phenomenal three to one newsletter strategy, value dense, et cetera. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you can kind of unpack some of the thinking that kind of went into some of those decisions along the way. Yeah. Um... I think mostly it was like just accepting there are a lot of constraints and the main one is time. So if I'm, you know, for the first five years I was solo, so I was the only one in the business. And then for the next five years, I had one person, Lindsay, who was working with me. So, you know, for the whole decade, basically, it's just been a one or two person team. So very small, very tight, very uh, time constrained. And based on those constraints, I just know that I can't do eight things well. So, you know, I, yeah, you're right. I don't have a YouTube channel or, you know, I've never had a podcast, hopefully up until, you know, sometime soon. Um, and uh, that 
it was definitely a conscious choice. I mean, I had a moment where, you know, I, ha- I used to have a LinkedIn profile or Pinterest profile or things like that. And I, you know, I deleted those or just turned them into like a static landing page, basically. And that says like, this is not, you know, an active page, like, please go to jamesclear.com. So um, my other thought with that, in addition to the time constraint was, you know, the experience of a new reader if you come and you're like, okay, this guy has, you know, 500,000 email subscribers. And then you go to, um, you know, a social media platform and like 3000 people follow them there. You're like, something isn't adding up. Like I thought this was a bigger deal than, you know, than what it seems. So I'd rather be big on like the, the platforms that I have, I'd rather them be really solid and valuable and not like water down the brand with a platform elsewhere that just like doesn't provide a whole lot. People don't really follow it kind of like, Um, decreases the brand value. So I think there's uh, some benefit there as well to focusing and like making sure each part of the ecosystem is strong rather than, um, yeah, watering down the experience in certain areas. Then instead of potentially risking like watering down in a lateral way in terms of adding breadth, right, to an audience or, or to a brand and thinking instead about depth, you know, certainly there's a massive surge in the email space around like private newsletters or, or variants, right? That are then behind a paywall and it's subscription based. You know, mm. Substack is massive, you know, et cetera. Uh, we're seeing similar trends in podcasting, though, that are maybe flexing into kind of audio first, right? And building audience predominantly through, through podcasting. You know, obviously big surges with now like premium uh, variants of podcast feeds, et cetera. Um, um, maybe curious on, on your thinking here, even like if you have been tempted to explore like a Substack oriented, maybe not Substack specifically, right? But but mm-hmm. something that then is aligned still to your constraint of medium that that emphasizes that strength, that then starts to think at a certain point in time, right? After our audience is built and starting to grow and it's prosperous and it's attractive, to then insert a corollary, right? That has maybe a monetization component. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I thought about a paid newsletter subscription or a paid podcast subscription, you know, who knows, maybe we'll pursue something like that in the future. I think uh, it's hot right now for some, I don't know, for some particular reason, there are things I like about it. Like the incentives are aligned, you know, you are, your readers are paying you directly, like, oh, that's great. I don't like the content treadmill part of it. Um, I would feel really guilty dipping out of some of that. I mean, if people are paying me, there's like a lot of pressure to ship every week. And I still have a fair amount of pressure to ship every week, but like I've mentally been able to compartmentalize it and, you know, handle it well, even though it's for, you know, a free way or for the sending the newsletter to a free audience. But, um, but I, yeah, I, so I resist the content treadmill part of it a little bit. I do think, um, I do think there are many different options once you have a large audience. And the phrase I like to remind myself of whenever I kind of get locked into these little, you know, business strategy uh, thinking sessions, you're like, oh, we could start a newsletter, we could start a paid podcast or whatever is, you, know, you don't have to make all the money, like, you don't, and you don't have to make it all the ways, you know, like, re- all you really need is one model that works well for you. And it took me many years to figure this out. Like I tried keynote speeches. I tried courses. Um, I tried in-person workshops, online courses, um, you know, a bunch of different affiliate revenue, like all kinds of different business models. And eventually what I found is actually books are the best thing for me. I don't, I don't know that it's the best thing for every creator, but it really works well for my style of business, my lifestyle, what I want to create and the way I want to um, share work with the world. And that model of have a really big free audience and then make money through book sales on the back end, I feel great about it. It scales really well and um, it works for me. So I don't need, you know, I don't need every other model as well. So I think some of this also comes back to the simplicity and focus discussion we were having just a minute ago. You know, it applies not just to platforms, but also to business models. Um, You know, the more sources of revenue you have, the more uh, overhead and oversight and management and larger the team and all that. And so sometimes you get into kind of this red queen effect where you're running faster and faster, but you're kind of ending up in a very similar place. You know, like you've, you've tripled the number of products that you offer or the number of revenue streams you have, but you end up with like maybe 20% more uh, profit at the end of the day uh, because the team is larger and so on. And so you're like, man, we're running really fast now, but like we didn't really have a ton to show for it. So, um, yeah, I think for that reason, I like to try to keep it simple as well. I, I love that emphasis on business models. I think about that a lot, you know, even for SPI, we do have a lot of things going on, but, you know, normally for early stage creators, the folks that we have, you know, the great pleasure to serve through SPI, 
yeah, these are folks that are just looking to you know, largely replace a nine to five income, you know, live life on their own terms uh, and don't have a lot of resources. They don't want to build a lot of teams, right? And, and have that, you know, to your point overhead. So uh, I'm just grateful that, you know, you're emphasizing that stuff. I, I think it's really important. Uh, and again, I think in, uh, increasingly important from at least where I sit for creators looking into next year, 2022, how, how can they do stuff better that's working kind of, you know, consistent with the times, right? Mm -hmm. With so much distraction, uh, limited resourcing, still some pandemic issues um, and need to be making, you know, really tough decisions on where they put their time, energy and other forms of resources. So no, I just appreciate that. So thank you. So for you, uh, thinking ahead to 2022, maybe we can wrap up with some some hot takes. Um, I'm curious, like what are, especially for you at, at your scale, your success, uh, what are some audience oriented goals that you have for yourself next year? Yeah, I don't know that I have any hot takes necessarily. Um, we haven't really set like specific goals for audience growth or things like that. It's more about continuing to do what we already know works. So, you know, producing great content, sharing things that are valuable and actionable and practical for people doing that on a reliable schedule. You know, if we do those things, then wherever we end up will probably be pretty good. Um, I do think it'd be like, I have some kind of big picture things. I think it'd be fun in the long run, you know, like I think it'd be cool to send an email and have a million people open it. Um, you know, like we have a million people on the list, but it'd be fun to like actually have a million people's attention for a particular message. Um, to do that, we probably, our current open rate is about 40%. We probably would need, you know, I don't know, somewhere between two and 3 million subscribers. Um, but I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I'm not like hung up on that happening, but I just think it'd be neat. That's awesome. Um, That'd be I think, cool. uh, <laughs> I think um, getting to over a million on both social accounts for, at Twitter for Twitter and Instagram, um, that would be good. I don't have a timeline for when I want it to happen, but, um, but I think that'd be good. Those accounts have played an increasingly important role in email list growth too. Uh, and so I think if those are growing, then a lot of good things are probably happening for the email list as well. So, so that's a good sign. Um, yeah, I think those are probably the main ones. And then like our big projects are actually like writing, you know, I'm writing a second book and we're working on a podcast. So um, those are those are like the things that I really would like to accomplish. And then, you know, where the audience growth falls is kind of where it falls. That's great. Uh, let me pick at the, you know, Twitter or social to, to, to email thing you just said there. Is, is there mm -hmm. like a key thing that you're doing, a mechanic, a tactic that's effective right now in helping convert folks from social over to email? You know, if you try to think about this, just like first principles style, um, the game is always the same, regardless of what platform you're talking about. Like you always start with like, where are people directing their attention? You know, where, where are people already at? Where, where are the eyeballs directed? And right now uh, that tends to be social, you know, like a lot of people pay a lot of attention to social. Um, but you know, in the past you could say, oh, it was the New York times front page, or it was the, you know, CBS this morning, you know, um, media segment or whatever. Like it's, you know, it, it, the medium changes, but the idea is always the same where are people hanging out. And then once you find out where they're hanging out and specifically like where your audience or your readers are hanging out, then you just want to get in front of them there with the most valuable or useful content you can. And so, um, we don't start with like email on Twitter or Instagram. We start with like, how can we do something useful on this platform? And, um, you know, I just try to share the most useful content I can in each one. If you do that and you're hanging out where people already are, like they're going to start hanging around you. You're going to start attracting them. You'll get more followers or, you know, gradually build the audience and so on. And once people are paying attention, then I think it's the time to say, okay, what's the most valuable platform for us? It's email. So maybe we start dropping in a couple, you know, stories or posts or whatever that direct people toward the email list that can either be sharing, you know, like here's a little segment from this week's email. If you want more like this, go here and sign up. It can be a more direct ask and just saying, you know, over a million people subscribe, click here to join. Um, but most of the time for us, it's like subtle, soft mentions, you know, it's like in the caption or it's, you know, at the end of the story or something like that. And um, it's really just about providing a ton of value where people are already hanging out and then providing these easy entrance ramps uh, to whatever platform you're prioritizing, yeah. in my case, email. That's great. The first principles references, I think, spot on also <laughs> from where I sit. So that's excellent. It's just uh, going to change. You know, I mean, you've seen this, like things have changed a lot just since we've started, a ton. You know, like in the last a 10 ton. years. I mean, it's just very, it's very different. So you can't get hung up on thinking like, 
Instagram is the way to grow or whatever. It's, it's right. like, it's going to be something else in three years, you know? So like you need to, to be willing to shift, but understand the core principles. Yeah. So, so kind of through that lens, certainly uh, in terms of like where you might see the puck going, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, you know, where, where are you thinking and, and, and like, what's maybe to, to even give that more precision, like a challenge or an obstacle that at least maybe for you as a creator uh, might stand in your way that you're thinking about solving for next year. Yeah. Well, the biggest obstacle is very easy to answer. It's me. I'm the biggest bottleneck in this business. You know, like the problem with any kind of creator led business is if I'm creating all the content, then everybody else, the audience and my team are waiting on things from me, you know, like they can't do their job unless I'm making something. And so the real challenge is the way I write books, which seems to be in whatever way leads to the maximum suffering. Um, <laughs> it just requires a lot of time. I can't, I can't write a book every year. I, you know, I, I can't, I'm not even writing books every two years. Like I need, you know, depending on how you measure it, Atomic Habits took between three and five years to write. Um, you know, I'm already about two years under contract on this new one. Um, so it just, uh, yeah, it just takes a while. And so that figuring out how to manage the ebb and flow of like content creation for these large projects, um, is one thing. And then even if you aren't doing big things, like even if you're not doing, you know, some big project, like writing a book, well, you might be sending a newsletter every week or publishing podcasts every week. Well, you know, that's really important to do and you can stick to it for two or three or four or five years, but like talk to any creator who's done this for eight years or 10 years or something, you know, and at some point you start to feel a little bit of burnout um, or you need to mix it up or I don't know. It's just, um, so managing that in the long run, like the way to grow a huge audience is just to keep compounding for, you know, two or 10 or 20 years. And it's hard to do stuff for 10 or 20 years. Um, so there's, I think that's probably the biggest obstacle is uh, long-term creative cons consistency and what that looks like um, for people who are trying to build an audience and make something great. Um, in terms of like where the puck is going, I have no idea. Um, I, <laughs> I, I wish I knew, but I think I'm going to try to bet on things that like, if it's been true for a while, I feel more confident that it'll remain true for a while. So email has been really important for a long time, relatively speaking. I mean, certainly much, much longer than social media. So I'm going to keep prioritizing that. Um, the other thing is we own, there are only a few platforms you can own as a creator. You can own your email list, you can own your website, you can own your podcast. That's about it. And then all the other stuff, Twitter, F Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, you know, they're, they can be very powerful for the growth of your business, but you don't own them. And so I think moving forward, you know, my general um, approach has been, let's use the external platforms to grow the things that we do own. And uh, if the external things become huge on their own and really valuable, then that's great. But I'm not going to bank on that for my business. And I, I think that trend is also, you know, something that I will continue to do. So um, that's pretty future proof. So to yeah, speak, I think I, yeah. hopefully, you know, like, I mean, you know, there are always flaws and in, in ideas, but I, I feel like that's the kind of safer, more long-term approach. Excellent. Uh, well, I, I'll get you out of here on, on maybe just one last uh, hot take, if I can, uh, a ton of people emulate you uh, and for good reason. I'm curious, like who, who really stands out to you and, uh, as smart kind of crushing it that you're curious about and kind of studying and, and potentially maybe starting to emulate in some way. I think uh, my general strategy with this throughout my career has been, let me try to find people who are like two years ahead of me and see what they've been doing. And then that kind of illuminates the next step. Like I don't have any single person that I look to and I'm like, yeah, you know, I want to do everything the way they do it. I'm trying to do it my way and, you know, in a way that fits for, for my lifestyle and approach. But um, right now, one thing that I'm thinking a lot about is what about launching books? So I've done one, um, you know, so, you know, still fairly new to this. How do we build a career around being an author? And I think Brene Brown and Malcolm Gladwell, both are ones that I look to where I'm like, oh, I kind of like the style that they do it in. You know, they launch consistently. They come out with books every three years or four years or something like that. But they don't, they don't write all the time. Like they're not publishing every year. Um, and whenever they do, it's kind of a big event, you know, like, you know, when the next one is coming, they do a whole launch for it. And I kind of like that style. So I, um, both of them are more prolific than I have been as an author. I'm not sure that, uh, that I have six or eight books in me or however many they've produced. 
Um, but I like the idea of it. And uh, I think there are a lot of things that I can learn from, from their approach. So I've been looking at them recently uh, from the author standpoint. I, I love that perspective. Um, James, thanks. This is awesome. Really appreciate the time today. Uh, jamesclear.com is, I think, probably right uh, the best focal point uh, for folks to go that maybe in some crazy universe haven't stumbled across your work. Uh, but if correct me if I'm wrong, uh, where should folks go to learn more about you or engage with you? Yeah, yeah, no, jamesclear.com is the, the right place to start. Um, if you're interested in the newsletter, you can click on newsletter and check out 321. Um, and uh, yeah, if you want to dive in deeper, Atomic Habits is, uh, is waiting for you. So feel free to check out the book. Well, that's perfect. Well, thank you again, James. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you.